when we think of old believers, most of us, we might learn about the old believers when we get a general history of Russian history for those of us who learn it. And for those who do learn, we are often familiar with the old believers who first appear in Russian history in the mid 17th century, in the event often referred to as the Raskol or simply schism uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church over disagreements uh, over the reforms introduced by then Patriarch Nikon. Unfortunately, in those same general histories of Russia, particularly for those of us in the West, that is often where the story of the old believers ends, with the exception of their occasional reappearance and brief mentions as examples of one of many groups oppressed during the centuries of Tsarist autocracy in the Russian Empire. Similarly, for the centuries following the Raskol, even Russian historians themselves provided little depth to the study of the old believers beyond critiques or condemnation of the old believers' uh, refusal to abandon their faith and blaming this choice on simple, super, on simple superstition or even ignorance. Such an approach toward understanding the old believers both inside and outside of Russia over the centuries has led to, an actual, to, to the actual significance of the old right remaining generally unknown, misunderstood or even intentionally misrepresented, and therefore obscuring the old believers place within the larger scope of Russian history. While this lecture itself will provide only a brief explanation of the history of the old right and its followers, it's my intention and hope to provide more insight and clarity, not only on the origins of the old believers, but also their significant historical role in Imperial Russia. More importantly, as will be explained, rather than existing as a persecuted religious minority, stubbornly holding on to their religious practices, the old believers, in fact, directly and actively challenge the official narrative presented by the state and church officials over the very definitions of Russian history, Russian identity, and Russian orthodoxy. Now, I'd like to note that while there are different groups who are part of the old right movement with different approaches to practicing the old right version of orthodoxy, for the sake of both simplicity and time in this lecture, I'll be focusing on the old right and its adherents as a collective movement and their shared experiences. In order to begin, we need to consider the question, who are the old believers? More importantly, we need to think about how old believers have been presented historically and culturally. Likely, for those with knowledge of the old believers' existence, the images that likely come to mind resemble some of the pictures shown here. For example, Vasily Surikov's famous painting depicting the arrest of Boyarina Morozova, one of the old right's earliest martyrs, on her way to prison and inevitable death while defiantly showing her devotion to the old right with her two-fingered sign of the cross. Other more common historical images are often those of men with long beards and women with head scarves or other coverings and both in what is often referred to as traditional peasant clothing. Even today, images of stories or the, of the old believers depict communities seemingly lost in time while living in simple wood structures in remote locations in the wildernesses of, of Siberia and Alaska. Take, for example, likely the most famous old believer alive today, Agafia Likova, seen here on the top right. Even outside of Russia, Agafia's story is well known as the last surviving member of her family, which had lived in isolation for decades before their accidental rediscovery in the Russian taiga by Soviet geologists in 1978. Since then, media outlets outside of Russia often depict Agafia as representative of the typical old right lifestyle, one based in isolation and abstinence from most of the modern world. Such misrepresentations of the old right are not new to our own times. For centuries, what studies on the old right that were produced both inside and outside of Russia followed this similar rubric, that old believers as a movement represented a rejection of progress and modernity and rigid adherence to old Russian superstition and backwardness. The term old believer itself is a misnomer that originates from the Russian church and state who used the term raskolniki, or schismatics, and then staroveri, or old believers to emphasize this perceived backwardness through the 17th and 18th centuries. As we will explore, it was not any difference in belief or church dogma that witnessed widespread rejection of, the, of Patriarch Nikon's reforms. It was Nikon's changes to church rituals and liturgical books that sparked the Raskol. Hence, the self-identifying term for those who rejected Nikon's reform became Starobradzi, old ritualists. The issue of identity then is a major theme we need to understand the history of the old right and its adherents. Specifically, the old right inherently is a movement over the very understanding and definitions of what it meant to be both Russian and Orthodox. And these groups directly challenge the Tsarist state and church on these issues. To shed light on this matter, we can consider one of the early 20th century Russia's most notable old believer families, the Rabushinskys. 
particularly Vladimir here on the bottom, on the bottom right left, and his brother Pavel on the bottom right to the right, were part of one of Rogochkoy Cemetery's most affluent families. And they used their wealth after 1905 to begin producing Old Believer publication houses in order to publish Old Right materials, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the end of this, and more specifically, begin to share the Old Right view of their own history, culture, and existence in the Russian public sphere for the first time in history. <clears throat> to the Rabushinsky and other Old Believers, it was the old right that maintained any real ties to Russia's cultural, historical, and spiritual development in the past, present, and into the future. Arguing in his work, The Old Right and Russian Religious Feeling, Rabushinsky argues, to understand the reasons behind Nikon's Greekification, one only needs to look at his character. It was simply his love for power. In, in, to the end, the old prayer books were declared corrupt, evil, full of errors, clearly concluding for all the people, all of the Russian church hierarchs of the previous centuries, including the most famous, respected, even the most beloved saints, have obviously been all, without exception, either heretics or ignorant. Therefore, for the enlightenment of the Russian spirit, one must understand the meaning of the old believers and need to consider what role they played in the history of Russian culture. For it is the old believers and the religious phenomenon that are most acquainted with the history of Russia's spiritual feeling especially in the period from the late 17th century to the present day, and therefore it becomes all the more important to gain a proper understanding of Russian orthodoxy and indeed the Russian reality. What then is this spiritual feeling that Ryabashinsky references? And why is it critical to understanding the old believer's place in Russian history? For this lecture, then, I will help answer these two points raised by Ryabashinsky and other old believers themselves to better explain the old right as a movement and its place and influence in Russia's historical development through the imperial era. To begin with, we need to understand this first point, the Russian spiritual feeling, and how the old right and its various branches place themselves into the larger world of orthodoxy and Christendom. And so I'm going to provide a very brief kind of cliff notes version of the historical events that will ultimately set us up for the Raskol of the Russian Orthodox Church. The short version of this, again, it, just for the sake of simplicity, is that Russian Orthodoxy as a whole sees itself as the inheritor of the true lineage of Christendom as started back both with Christ and his apostles, but more importantly with the formation of the Christian Church at the Council of Nicaea under Constantine the Great. Uh, Constantine the Great. The belief then follows this idea that from 325 on, ultimately Russian Orthodoxy is the sole inheritor of the truest and purest form of Orthodox and proper Christianity. The old believers see themselves as the sole now defenders of that process. So how do we get there? Well, if we move through the various periods from 325, you have various church councils, you have various uh, new theological ideas and things like that that lead to breakaway moments in the history of Christendom. You see the breakaway of various churches. You have things like the Great Schism in 1054, where Roman Catholicism developed from and moves away from Eastern Orthodoxy. But where this starts to become important for the Russian spiritual worldview is not until 1439. Now, up until this point, the Russian Orthodox Church is something that has been referred to by many historians of Russian history as the loyal student of the Greeks. Unlike their counterparts, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, and other Slavic peoples who almost quickly attempted to establish independent, autonomous Orthodox churches of their own, the Russians have been reliant on the Greeks. Every metropolitan of Kiev, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church up to this point, had been Greek-born themselves. 1439 is important because of the event known as the Council of Florence, or more commonly referred to as the, the Union of Florence. At this union, then Emperor John VIII of Constantinople makes an offer to the Pope. Now, at this time, the Eastern Roman Empire is near done. It's surrounded by the Ottoman Empire, leaving only Constantinople and a few scarce territories left to the Eastern Roman Empire. John VIII makes a deal with the Pope that if the Pope were to call a new crusade, he would then agree to place all of the Eastern Orthodox churches under the leadership of the Pope, return 
uh, everything to Rome and make the Pope the head of all Christendom in the world. The Catholics jump all over this. Absolutely sounds like a good deal. However, the Eastern Orthodox churches don't like this. And more importantly, one of the biggest proponents of this union is Isidore of Kiev, the Metropolitan of Kiev. He is actually sent back to Russia as a cardinal of the Catholic Church to convert Russia to Catholicism. And when he returns, he is almost immediately, it takes two days, to arrest him. Vasily II, Grand Prince of Russia, has Isidore arrested for betraying the faith. And it is at this moment that Vasily II tells the Patriarch of Constantinople, no more Greeks. We're not going to accept any more Greek leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church. It's going to be Russians from now on. And so a few years later in 1448, you have the election of St. Iona, the first metropolitan of Moscow. So that even the title of the position changes from metropolitan of Kiev to metropolitan of Moscow. And it is, and Iona is the first Russian elected to this position. So de facto, the Russian Orthodox Church is now independent. It's autonomous. Not long after that, 1453, you have the fall of Constantinople, which is now seen as God's punishment for the Greeks' efforts to abandon their faith. Then you have a series of other events that take place in Russia that seem to be, in the Russian spiritual mindset, placing Russia on a unique path. 1472, you have the marriage of Ivan III, or Ivan the Great, to Sophia Pelelogin, the niece of the last Byzantine emperor. And so now the Russian ruling house, the Rurikids, have a direct line to the Roman imperial house. They have a son, Vasily, who becomes Vasily III. Not only that, Ivan the Great is the one who ends the Mongol yoke. He ends Russia, the Russian principality's vassalage to the Golden Horde, which had been a successor state, uh, successor empire to one of to Genghis Khan's uh, Mongol empire. And so suddenly now Russia has established its own spiritual autonomy. It has thrown off its vassalage to a foreign invader. And they now have a direct bloodline to the Eastern Roman Imperial Court. It's not long after this that you start to see these proclamations of what gets referred to as the Third Rome Doctrine. This idea that Russia, by God's divine grace has now been put on this special path to be the true inheritor of the Roman Byzantine legacy, that Rome was the lawgiver, the Eastern Roman Empire established and standardized Christianity, and now you'll get this final and this final uh, begin this final entity of a Roman Empire based out of Russia. And it'll be Russia's duty to carry this legacy on until the end times because Christianity likes to work in its threes there's not going to be a fourth Rome that's the famous line the third Rome stands firm there will not be a fourth as written by Philofeo of Skoff in 1510 what then develops within the Russian mindset is this sense of what ultimately gets referred to historically as holy Rus. Russia as an entity, as a people, that this is both about Russia as a state and Russia as a people, all peoples within Russia now have this destiny to uphold the very existence of this holy roots. And the populace therefore must defend their orthodoxy from outside corruption. And in this mindset, such corruption can only come from two places and two places alone, the West, more specifically Rome, or weak rulers, weak leaders. And the Russians begin pointing to these historical moments to show how this works. So first example that gets used is the Council of Florence and the fall of Constantinople. You had John VIII, a weak ruler, who was desperate to save himself and his city and decided to try and offer up all of orthodoxy on a serving platter for it and turn to the Pope, the source of Western corruption. Combine those, weak ruler, again, now Constantine XI is the one who is emperor at the fall of Constantinople, but the damage was done. Weak leadership turned to the West and its corruption leads to fall of Constantinople, end of Second Rome. But the Russians also have examples of strong leaders defying these corruptions. For example, the German efforts to forcefully convert the Russian people to Catholicism during the Northern Crusades in the, in the 1200s 
are defeated by Alexander Nevsky. Strong, le strong Russian leader defeats Western corruption. You, but however, more recently for the Russians, beginning in the late 1500s and the aftermath of Ivan the Terrible's rule, which had destabilized Russia, you have this period of the time of troubles in which following Ivan the Terrible's reign, his destabilization of Russia because of his chaotic rule leads to a series of weak Russian rulers. Now they don't turn to the West, but the West comes to them through the guise of Poland. Poland uh, establishes essentially several puppet rulers, uh, the false Dimitris, uh, and tries to lay claim to the Russian throne itself. And that kind of rocks the Russian mindset because you have all these positive events in the late 1400s. You have the development of this third Rome and Holy Roots mentality in the 1500s. And then by the end of the 1500s and early 1600s, it's seeming like it's all falling apart. So did Russia already, already fail in its mission becomes this big question. And the time of troubles really rocks to the core that Russian spiritualism that Ryabushinsky had been re, uh, referring to. What then is Russia's destiny? And what comes out of it then is the formation of a group of basically who's who of both Russian Orthodox church leaders and uh, political leaders. And they call themselves the Zealots of Piety. These Zealots of Piety are made up of the future Tsar Alexei. Again, he is now just Tsarevich at the time. They begin in the 1630s, so he's not Tsar just yet. Some of his closest soon-to-be advisors, and also various popular leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church, such as, at this time, Archmandrake Nikon, as well as uh, the Archpriests Avakum, Daniel, and Logan, and uh, Chipavo of Kolomna as well, too. So you have Nikon, and then on the other side of it, you have who are going to be kind of the founders of this old right movement. Now, the Zealots of Piety are specifically of the mindset that what needs to come out of Russia in the 1600s, now that they are starting to stabilize with the rise of the Romanov dynasty, is a reinvigoration of the Russian Orthodox Church. That, that, that the time of troubles was this warning that Russia was not on its correct path. Russia needed to course correct. And the best way to do that, according to the Zealots of Piety, was to reinvigorate the Russian Orthodox Church, ensure that the Russian Orthodox Church was truly engaging with its followers, and to strengthen it, more importantly, make it a stronger central force. Because Russia being so vast and so spread out, it was difficult to centralize authority. Now, the Zealots of Piety already know that Alexei is going to become Tsar, so they're going to get that side of the power. It's not until 1652 that the Zealots get their next opportunity with the vacancy of the Patriarch of Moscow. And by this time, the Russian Orthodox Church has gained its own Patriarchate. And in 1652, it's, it's really a close race between two individuals. It's Nikon or Archpriest Avakum. Now, both of them take the usual, now again, this is of course as is passed down, both of them take the usual, don't vote for me, vote for my friend, I'm going to be humble about this kind of approach. And it's a very close election with Nikon coming out on top. And for the Zealots of Piety, it doesn't matter. You know, their top, you know, two of their top guys were the ones in the running for the Patriarchate, and now they can really enact their goal. Again, Alexei becomes Tsar in 1645, and now you've got the Patriarchate. The zealots are in charge, or the zealots of piety are now in charge of Russia. And so Abakum now takes his position and decides, well, first things first, we need to make sure that the Russian Orthodox Church is doing things as we're supposed to. Because in 1593, with the establishment of the Patriarchate of Moscow, the decree granting a Patriarchate had stated that the Russian Orthodox Church needs to remain in dogmatic uniformity with the Greek church, makes sense. You don't wanna believe something different than the other Orthodox churches. So what Nikon does is that he has some emissaries go and buy contemporary Greek printed books. There's a couple of problems with this. One, it's Greek books printed in the 1600s. 
Second thing is Nikon himself does not uh, actually read Greek and he has to have these Greek books translated because they're written in Greek, not Slavonic. And so he has them translated and as he starts going through them, he realizes that there are some differences, not dogmatic differences between the Greeks and the Russians, ritualistic differences. Uh, liturgical differences, spelling differences between names and things like that. And so Nikon decides, uh-oh, we can't have them, and we need to change that. We need to change the Russian books to match the Greek book. And so he takes that to the Zealots of Piety, and he presents the changes he wants to introduce. Now, I'm not going to go too detail on all the changes, uh, but generally just touch on them. Some of these changes are going to include the spelling of names. For example, even the name Jesus is now going to be spelled differently from Jesus to Jesus. He begins adding words to things like the Nicene Creed and taking away other words to the Nicene Creed to match it to what the Greeks currently have. But the big and most visible change that he makes is the sign of the cross between the old way of the two-fingered sign of the cross with the two fingers above representing the dual natures of Christ divine and man, and man all in one, trinity below with the three fingers, to now three fingers with a pinched uh, two four fingers and thumb, and the two concealed inside the palm. And he takes these changes to the zealot of piety first. He takes it to his close friends. Again, and they had all been friends up to this point as well, too. And he says to the zealots, here's the changes I want to make. And overwhelmingly, the zealot of piety say, absolutely not. Why would you want to make our church like the Greeks right now? They are 200 years now dominated by the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim empire. They are being punished because they had turned away from true orthodoxy. And so now you want our church to change to be like the Greeks. And for this religious mindset of we are on a special path and destiny, changing anything up risks heresy. And so this becomes the big debate, is that would changing spellings, would changing practices, would changing rituals effectively negate what the Russian Orthodox Church can do and can it fulfill its mission? And the Zelts of Piety reject this. They absolutely not. And so Nikon takes this as, you know, gets offended by this and says, you know what, I'm going to take this to a full church council, What he does. Uh, in 1656. And so he goes to his church council, and even there, he finds difficulty getting support for his changes. Now, he does have his supporters. He does have you know, his people who do throw his support behind him. But he has very outspoken critics, Bishop Pavel of Kolomna, one being the big ones, Avakum being another. So what Nikon does is he has them thrown out of this church council, out of the sabor and replaced with more people who will support him, where finally he gets enough support uh, after throwing out those who were against him uh, to say, all right, we'll go with these changes. And so Nikon begins ordering all monasteries, churches, parishes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to now start using the new practices that he has introduced and also get rid of all their old books to get these new ones. And that doesn't go over well. Many monasteries, many priests, many churches refuse to abandon the old practices for the exact same fears that, we, that I just described. That changing Russian orthodoxy to the way that the Greeks practice it at the time is inviting devastation. And so Nikon, seeing how little support he has, decides he is going to put on a show, and he decides, you know what, I'm going to just quit. If you don't want to listen to me, clearly I'm not fit to be patriarch. I'm going to go to my monastery, in uh, New, which is called New Jerusalem Monastery, uh, and I'm going to just sit there, and I'm going to wait for you to beg me to come back. Well, that happens in 1658, and it doesn't happen. No one asks him to come back. Uh, Nikon had hoped that Alexei would say, no, no, Nikon, you need to come back. He hoped that the church, you know, various church uh, you know, leaders would say, Nikon, you need to come back. We're sorry. And that this resistance to his reforms would end. But it doesn't happen. And so instead, Nikon's opponents, the anti-Nikonians, just maintain what they're doing. They don't change anything about their practices. They maintain what are now going to be the old rites. Uh, and eventually there starts to become a push to get Alexei involved 
because then you need a patriarch and you can't just have this, you know, guy moping in his monastery pretending he's not the patriarch. And they go to Alexei and they say to Alexei, basically, and again, I'm summarizing this <laughs> as well, too. So keep that in mind that it's up to the czar's role. The czar is protector of Orthodox. He's protector of Russian Orthodox. And so it is his duty to intervene in the church when necessary. And here is a necessary moment. Now, Alexei likes hearing that as well, too. He gets to be in charge of the Russian state and the Russian church. Awesome. So Alexei calls for a new church sabor, a new church council in 1666. He does two big things out of this. Excuse me. The first one is that he says, all right, we're done with Nikon. He deposes Nikon and has one of his supporters, Josephus, named as the new patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. And then Alexei decides also that the church will adopt Nikon's reforms. Why does he do this? Well, the analysis and the acceptance is that Alexei does it because it gives him more authority over the church. And in fact, from this point on, because again, we're only going to have a few more before uh, Peter the Great ultimately gets rid of the patriarchate in favor of the Holy Synod, the czar now has more control over the church. And the patriarch essentially is a second tier uh, leader at this point. And so Alexei now has firm control over both state and church. And so this is a way by accepting the reforms, they're his reforms. They are, they are referred to as Nikonian reforms, but Alexei is the one legitimizing them. Which means now that those who do not accept these changes are not just in defiance of the church. They are in defiance of the state. And so they are now declared heretics. Raskolniki, those schismatics. Enemies of both church and state. <clears throat> and so what starts to then happen is within the old believer mindset, or those who are now going to become old believers, is that this was all a ploy by Antichrist. That Nikon was weak and therefore corrupted and became an agent of Antichrist. But the real Antichrist is now potentially Alexei himself. That this was somehow always Alexei's plan. He has now subverted the authority of the church and placed it all in his hands. And so this first generation of old believers face extreme persecution right away. Because, again, they are enemies of the church and now of also the state. These early old believers face imprisonment, exile, or death, or ultimately all three, such as Avakum, seen here at the bottom. Again, he is arrested several times, ultimately exiled to Siberia, arrested again, and ultimately burned at the state for being a heretic. Oyarina Morozova, as we already talked about early on, arrested and starved to death in prison. You do have efforts at resistance as well, too, such as the Solovetsky Monastery uprising on the Solovetsky Islands. Now, again, the Solovetsky Monastery, away up in Russia's uh, far north, islands, easy to defend. This rebellion lasts for eight years from 1668 to 1676. When the Russian army finally does put it down, survivors who are still trapped in the monastery decide to take uh to take measures of mass suicide rather than live in the world that they see as ruled by antichrist those who are able to escape persecution have really two options themselves flee out to russia's wilderness and many do they go to the far north they go to the far south borderlands they even go outside of russia to places like poland and austria they go far out east to siberia or they can hide in plain sight and not be so out about their faith. Now, the old believers themselves do split into two main branches. And again, if you have questions about some specifics about the branches, I'm happy to answer them later on. But the two main branches of the old rites uh, become what are known as the priest list and the priestly old believers. The debate being over the how the church can function in the post Nikonian world. That going back to that belief that Russian Orthodoxy had been the sole inheritor of an unbroken line from 325, this is a clear break. Now, the priestless sects decide that, well, we will just live as Christians did before the Council of Nicaea. We didn't have a church then. We will live that way. We don't need a church to continue our faith. 
again, I'm greatly summarizing. So again, I'm happy to elaborate when questions come up. Um, and uh, the priest, the priest Lee branches, believe that those who are part of the Nikonian church can always return to the church, to the proper church, to the old right church as well too. And so often rely on what we referred to as runaway priests to maintain a tie to a Russian church. Now, collectively, for the most part, far and away, most uh, old believers on either side do recognize each other as old believers because that becomes the defining trait. Those who reject the Nikonian reforms are old believers. So, while the old rights initial experiences introduced the old believers to a state, uh, to state and church persecution, it's not actually going to be long before the old believers establish themselves successfully as a major influence in Russia's historical, cultural, and religious development. This success came from the opportunities that the old right and its adherents utilized in order to both survive repeated efforts at persecution while making the most, most of periods of leniency and even partnership with the Tsar state. Most importantly, by the first half of the 18th century, most old believer communities viewed themselves as an integral part of the Russian empire but continued to strive to preserve that Holy Rus and Third Rome doctrine. Not long after the Raskol, you have then the ascension of Peter the Great as Tsar of Russia. And of course, Peter turns Russia on in its head. He is staunchly about change, introducing his Petrine revolution in which he seeks to change all aspects of the way that Russia functions as an entity. What he most importantly does is that with his Petrine revolution, he decides that what Russia needs to be is a service state in which all members of society contribute to the prosperity and progress of Russia. And so what that means is that the old believers too are going to find their own relationship with the Russian empire redefined and find new opportunities for success even while at the same time decrying Peter's turn towards Westernism. Uh, and again, Peter the Great, well known for uh, his debauchery as well too, so not exactly a model czar uh, in the old believer mindset. Uh, and so the, while the old believers can decry uh, Peter's turn towards the West, the old believers still see themselves as maintaining and preserving Russian Orthodox purity while Peter introduces his new rule. But more importantly, to Peter, the old believers become useful to the Russian state. That rather, the old believers, because they have spread out to the borderlands, because they've established thriving communities, and more importantly, a number of them kind of plant themselves on very important resource locations, that they will help Russia build a modern Russian state. Or they will help Peter build a modern Russian state, rather. The reason for this uh, is several reasons. The first is that Peter and his mate advisors realized very quickly that you, it's going to be impossible to root out old believers. You can't hunt them down. In fact, the most important characteristic that allowed for the old right survival was the fact that old believers identified themselves as both Russian and Orthodox. There is very little to discern an old believer from a mainstream Orthodox, and old believers permeate every social class from the peasantry on up to the nobility. <clears throat> As Peter and his successors soon accepted, the most discernible difference between an old believer and a non-old believer was that old believers often were more literate than their social class counterparts because of their reverence for books and book culture. So an old right peasant was often was far often more literate than a non-old right peasant. Old right merchant, more literate than a non-old right merchant, etc. 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 So Rather than hunt, and again, it's very difficult unless you're throwing out reading tests at people to figure out who's an old believer. And then what if you just find a literate, you know, peasant? Uh, rather than hunt down an unknown old number of old believers, which was estimated by most state agencies to be in the tens of millions throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries, Peter introduced policies to ensure that old believers contributed to, contributed to the Russian Empire predominantly economically. As would set the tone for the remainder of the imperial era, this often proved to be a double-edged sword for the old right community. And while state officials' desire to see old right communities prosper led to some protection from persecution by church officials, 
and in fact allowed for great prosperity by communities such as Vig in the north and the Old Believer communities providing labor to ironworks and gunsmiths owned by the Old Believer fam the Midoff family out in the Urals, it often led to increased financial burdens such as Peter's infamous beard tax and double tax placed on Old Believer men. And this is actually what you see here on the central picture is a token that once you paid your beard tax, because Peter liked Western uh, styles, so either shaved or European style mustaches, uh, this is more meant for nobles, merchants, things like that. You weren't going to tax every single uh, peasant out there who had a beard. Uh, you would get this token and you'd have to carry it around with you to where if a, you know, if a police uh, stopped you, you'd have to show this token that you paid your beard tax. Uh, but likewise, this protection only lasted as long as production for state demands remained met. Now, this, uh, just very quickly, this statue on the right is in the Ural city of Naviansk, which was the kind of capital of the Demidov uh, dynasty. Uh, Nikita Demidov uh, uh, helped establish some of Russia's earliest gun manufacturers as Peter's trying to build his empire. So, with such approaches introduced by Peter in place, by the second half of the 18th century, the old right throughout Russia experienced new growth and opportunities to build burgeoning communities and economic empires by the reign of Catherine the Great. More importantly, it was Catherine that lifted a number of restrictions on old believers, such as those forbidding old believers from moving where, such as those forbidding old believers from moving within the empire, thereby allowing them to relocate. This encouraged the growth of large old right migration to cities such as Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Nizhny Novgorod. Additionally, it was under Catherine the first discussion to create a state-sanctioned old right hierarchy called Edinaveria, or Unified Faith, developed and was ultimately finalized under her son Paul in 1798. While initially few old believers joined Edinaveria out of distrust that it was part of the Russian Orthodox Church and Russian state, the belief was that such policies reflected Catherine and Paul's own views of religious toleration and allowed for a path of reconciliation between Russia and the Old Right. Additionally, Catherine's policies toward, toward the Old Believers also provided more economic opportunities for the Old Right and the merchant class to expand their businesses, setting the stage for the first generations of some of Russia's wealthiest entrepreneurial dynasties, such as the Morozovs, Soldatenkovs, Prokhorovs, Rachmanov's, Rabuchinsky's, and Volsky's. Soon, with the growth of an old believer urban population and increased wealth among old believer merchant families, this led to the formation of large communities such as Rogorskoy Cemetery, seen here on the top right, and Priobrazhanskoy Cemetery, in Mos both in Moscow, Priobrazhanskoy on the lower right, which both soon established themselves as the centers of the priestly old right and priestless old right branches, respectively. So uh, Rogorskoy was a priestly center, Priobrazhanskoy was a priestless center, and both become these almost kind of major influences on the old right in their respective branches throughout the entire empire. However, as mentioned, the old right protections and old right success was all on a whim. Oftentimes, Old Reich's success inspired backlashes of targeted oppression by both the Russian Orthodox Church and their strongest supporters within state agencies. Particularly, by the end of the first quarter of the 19th century, Old Believer communities often became the target of persecution because of their strong emphasis on, uh, and the Old Reich's strong emphasis placed on charity through the creation of almshouses, hospitals, and other works. In particular, this was of great concern to Metropolitan Filaret of Moscow, one of the greatest persecutors of the old believers during his time. That particularly after the great fire of Moscow in 1812, the old believers at Rogoshkoy and Priyobrzezanskoy invest far more money in the rebuilding of Moscow, and more importantly, far more, far more money in the building of charitable institutions such as almshouses and hospitals than the Orthodox churches. Rather than compete uh, with the old right, Filaret, beginning in 1823, begins regularly sending requests to the Holy Synod, to the Tsar himself, uh, this at that time Alexander I still, saying that he is concerned, and he uses the continued phrase, 
that it will confuse the Orthodox as to why the old believers are the ones doing all the charity. Why are they creating the state-of-the-art almshouses and modern hospitals? And so rather than having the Russian Orthodox Church compete with the old believers, he says we need to shut them all down. Now, Alexander I is reluctant about that, but has actually establishes uh, some very uh, some secret uh, police uh, spies to keep tabs on the old believers. Uh, but that's the problem for people like Philaret is that the old right is doing better at showing compassion and charity than the old Russian Orthodox Church in his mind. So, because of this success, Metropolitan Philaret finds a new ally with the rise of Tsar Nicholas I, who reigns from 1825 to 1855, which will be a period of outright extreme persecution and oppression of the old right, because like Met Philaret, Nicholas is completely uh, untr untrusting towards anyone he sees as not fitting his perfect mold of a loyal Russian subject. And the old believers, not being part of the Russian Orthodox Church, fit that category. So, attempting, so Nicholas almost immediately makes an attempt to effectively outlaw the old right in order to push it towards extinction uh, with the help of Philaret. And so one of the first things that they want to do is that they start targeting old believer marriages. Now, they're not saying old believers can't be married, but what they say is that the state will not recognize old believer marriages as legal. This is designed to basically scare old believer merchants and nobility who are wealthy, basically saying that if their marriage is invalidated, then they will not be able to pass on inheritance to their sons. Same thing there is inheritance laws, that if a uh, son turns to Russian Orthodoxy or to Edina Veria, then they can sue their family to get sole inheritance. It doesn't mean it's going to win, but likely it is going to win. And so it's meant to attack the structures of that have maintained the old right family, community, things like that. Nicholas also makes it illegal for old believers to repair or build any new structures. That includes almshouses, for example, that cannot be repaired or maintained by rule of law. And not only that, he makes a final ditch effort by in the, in the early 1850s to force old believers to convert to orthodoxy or Edina Veria by particularly the merchants, by requiring them to, by saying that no longer can old believers be in the merchant class because it was a, its own social class. So outright targeting meant to eradicate the old right as a movement or force them at least to convert to Edina Veri. So while many old believer communities survived these eradication efforts and some of the restrictions were lifted under Alexander II and Alexander III, for example, the rules on marriages and inheritance were lifted, the remainder of the 19th century remained a period of severe limitations. Again, for example, one of the bans that was not lifted was the ability to repair structures. Uh, the, the old right still remained as a effective spiritual movement. In fact, I, it's ironic that while they are persecuted, the old believers, particularly those in the cities, are some of the first to begin helping Russia industrialize because most of the rest of the Russian nobility is focused on their land holdings, on their agrarian holdings. And so what that means is that since these old believer families have established factories and other industries, that when you have the end of serfdom and you have the movement of serfs, they have ready-made work for those former serfs, allowing them to just invest more into their factories and even create some of Russia's first banking monopolies as well, too. And part of this, and another interesting thing, act, act, part of this is that the old believers see themselves as enacting some more what they act, what some of them refer to in the Morozovs in particular. Morozovs and Parkorovs like to use this phrase compassionate capitalism uh, as the basis for their uh, approach towards industrialization. Uh, to where they have all these uh, workers comps kind of uh, uh, setups, things like that. Uh, Sergei Morozov, one of the younger Morozov sons, actually tries to unionize his own factory workers, which gets him in trouble with the rest of his family. But there's a belief that they are going, because they're old believers and therefore are claiming that they have this kind of moral high ground, that they're going to do industrialization better than the West had done and be more, quote unquote, compassionate about it. Yet, 
Even with that, the ultimate success for the old for the old right in the imperial area came in the events after 1905. Specifically, in a desperate effort to end the ongoing revolution and strikes that had started in January 1905 after the Bloody Sunday massacres, Nicholas II issued a decree on religious toleration for the old right in April of 1905. Now, this declaration provided religious toleration for all groups in the Russian Empire, but it makes no mentions of the Jewish populations, but it specifically is for the old believers. This decree does things such as return all personal and private property rights. So now old believers can restore and even build new structures. And not only that, it, it finally introduces the appropriate term for the old believers, Starobradsi, as their identifying term for the old right. Now, this quote unquote golden age of the old right uh, provides the old believers with a significant opportunity to again reintroduce themselves to Russia's public sphere. And in fact, desperate to find some semblance of traditional Russian uh, culture and history, historians, ethnographers, linguists, and other professionals all turn to the old believers and their extensive book, icon, art collections, hymn collections, etc., and so on, that they had been maintaining since the time of the Raskol. In fact, one of the most in-demand old right practices was their singing with their continued use of the Znameni chant, which had gone out of style with the Nikonian reforms. With the freedom to publish also, the old believers not only began mass publications of their prayer books and journals and magazines and other historical works, they began publishing their liturgical works as well too, such as an example that you see here of this printed manuscript. It is actually a printed copy of a manuscript printed in a manuscript style, whereas a manuscript would be written and illustrated by hand, this is done at a print shop. This is, an old, this is something that old believers would do. And so this proved to be extremely significant as the old believers now provided some ties to Russia's past through their engagement with the public sphere, providing Russians with views of not just their movement, but lost and new interpretations of Russian history and orthodoxy. Ultimately, however, this proved to be short-lived as the Bolshevik Revolution ultimately brought an end to this old right golden age. Ironically, however, the Bolsheviks, while still staunchly anti-religion, held the old right as a model of anti-authoritarian resistance and further proof of the Russians, of Russians' natural ability to be a collective and cooperative group of people. Yet, even with being held as this model of anti-authoritarianism, the old right suffers the same as other religious institutions under the Bolshevik persecutions. And so I'm gonna end this here. And so while I know that this lecture only skimmed the very surface of a very elaborate history and elaborate religious maneuver, I hope that this has provided a clear understanding of the old right and its significance to the course of Imperial Russian history. More importantly, I hope that this lecture has provided a great understanding of the fact that old believers throughout the Russian empire were not simply targets for oppression, but actively engaged with and challenged some of the very notions the Russian empire used to define itself. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for a very, very interesting discussion and the presentation. I'm always amazed how our guest speakers are able to pack so much information into a short 45, 50 minute presentation. So of course, there are no exception, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Also, Peter, I wanted to thank you for including so many of the illustrations in your presentation that are pieces from the museum. I really appreciate it when our speakers uh, use uh, materials from our collection to illustrate their talks. So we have an entity, attendee who asks, what does the old believer landscape look like today? What are the populations and how are they operating in the age of technology? So for example, what range of accommodations are being made to contemporary life and what is their status in today's Russia? So in Russia in particular, they are, there is a claim that attendance is good again, strong, I guess is how they, they usually refer to it. Um, for example, just recently, I, I saw this in the news, there was a meeting of the uh, Belichlinskaya hierarchy out in the Urals, and they said that there were 150 families present at this. Uh, I can't, I, I, I'm not reading at the time I had what they were celebrating. Uh, and, but 150 families, you know, you don't know what the number that really represents. Uh, but again, that's a, that's a strong number. The state in Russia is that, again, they are still active. Uh, they are still present. Uh, in, throughout all of Russia. They're present outside of Russia as well, too. 
uh, adapting to the present day. There are some old believers that do uh, like webinars, uh, things like that. Some of them in Russian. It's it's rare for the Russian. Uh, actually, the Erie, Pennsylvania Old Right community uh, does regular uh, YouTube live kind of presentations. They started doing that with the pandemic. Uh, as well, too. And they've maintained it as well, too. But they also, even before that, had things like some lessons and things like that online to go over, you know, brief history or uh, brief holidays, things like that. So there is some efforts at adaptation, depending on where you are, who you are. And it's usually an age thing as well, too, uh, or a generational thing, I guess I should say, rather. Uh, so there is a presence. Uh, numbers are, you know, it depends on what you read. Some numbers that I've read say it's similar to the Russian Orthodox Church that, you know, of course, on holidays, attendance is high. Rest of the year, it's, you know, not <laughs> high, I guess I'd put it. Uh, and so it, it, it's, you have to take things with a grain of salt. Without seeing it myself, uh, I can only rely on what I'm told, kind of thing like that. Thank you. So Roy is asking, were family groups often divided among religious lines or did families tend to worship in the same way? Actually, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I wish I had a lot more time to go into that, is that it's very, very interesting in that the answer, the short answer is no, they, they don't all necessarily worship together. So for, for example, the Morozov family, they are all, there's cousins, there's things like that. Some of them are priestless old believers. Some of them are priestly old believers. And then even, and then with the introduction of Edina Beria, and particularly with that push under Nicholas I uh, and all the restrictions he placed on, there are families that split between going to Edina Beria, some not, some uh, sticking with their own approach. And so, yeah, so again, without going into a whole other lecture on itself, because I, I have fantastic answers to that where I can go into great details and examples, but I'll, I'll just stick with that. But so the quick answer is no, there are families that are split across not just versions of orthodoxy, but versions of the old right as well, too. But even those within the old right uh, are still, you know, they're not like, it's not like, you know, civil war in the family. Priestly old believer family members work with priest, uh, priestless old believer, old believer family members and vice versa. And it, and it works out for them in the long run. And so, yeah, so no, but they still get along, I guess is the real short answer. Uh, what part have the old believers played in post-Soviet Russian Orthodox Church and Russian culture? So they have been, so in post-Soviet uh, church culture, they have, again, uh, particularly the Belokhrinskaya hierarchy and, Edin, and the Adinaveria branches, both priestly branches, have seen more activity um, than their counterparts. Because that those seem to be the groups that people I would I would say I, and I, I hesitate to use the term but I'd say interested is the term I would be uh, you know they're or curious maybe is a better term to use for that and so they've seen more activity um, coincidentally uh, <laughs> about the about the week before my book came out uh, Vladimir Putin actually did a whole big state visit to Ragoshkoy Cemetery. And, you know, talked about how critical that community was to Moscow, to Russian history and stuff like that. And even gave them this special designation, like we have our historical markers here in the United States, gave them this special designation as a historic community uh, and encouraged, you know, people to study it more and things like that. So it was, you know, it was good timing with my book that there was this kind of reinvigorated effort to integrate old believers into the post-Soviet state. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question regarding old believers and uh, accepting converts to their religion. Do you have to be born into being an old, old believer or do they accept people coming into the old right? They accept converts. Uh, they, the uh, old believers are open to converts. Uh, you, it, it, they do not accept previous baptism. So you would have to be, so you do get be baptized into the old right. Um, because again, the viewpoint being that other versions of Christianity are invalid because they broke away from that line that I was describing early on, dating back to 325. And so you need to be re, uh, re baptized. And so they do open converts. Um, and again, I actually know several converts <laughs> as, as well, too. Uh, but they do accept them. If, and that's, and that's usually the big difference is that they're surprised by is that they have to be re baptized, uh, because mm -hmm. of the view that, even if you are a Christian, no, you know, it's it's only partial credit to the old believers if you're already a Christian uh, and you have to be rebaptized into the old rite. 
So we have a question from Igor who asks, is it true that old believers were less affected by serfdom in Russia? Were they mostly free peasants? So that's a, that's a very interesting question, is that I'm not sure that it would be less affected by serfdom, but there is a greater effort on the part of the old believers to get out of serfdom because of these those wealthy families in particular. Um, they that's one of the charities that the old believers see themselves. And I wish I had more time to really go into it because that's a fascinating thing is that one of the old believer views on charity and compassion is to help get other people out of serfdom. And so particularly after 1812, and these families are making lots and lots of money, they, they see money as a blessing to be used to help other people. Uh, the Perkorovs, again, the Perkorovs and Morozov, again, have that compassionate you know, view that they, they love using that term compassion. And they try to put it into practice by literally going out and buying freedom for old believer serfs. And so that's where some of this comes from, is that the old believers are actively trying to help other old believers get out of serfdom uh, because they see it as part of that compassion and, and Christian charity that they should be emulating. Raymond asks, are there significant numbers of old believers in Ukraine? And also we have another question about the old believer community in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So could you comment a little bit about old believer communities outside of Russia, how they may have ended up there? What is their status now? I, I watched a documentary about uh, South American old believers, some of them actually relocating back to Siberia, interestingly, mm -hmm. and the government sort of helping them by giving out land, etc. So could you briefly comment on that? I, I definitely can, and it, it is, it. and that's actually a very important question considering present-day situations. And that, of course, we've likely have all heard in the past nine, ten months now, uh, the term Novorossiya. You know that term that Putin keeps using to describe well, that's really Russia's. That is a region that is defined by Catherine the Great, who she actually specifically opens up that region for old believer movement. As I mentioned, one of the freedoms that Catherine the Great had provided was the ability of old believers to move around. That region of what's now Eastern and Southern Ukraine, that Novorossiya, as Catherine had referred to it, had been under the control of the Crimean Khanate at the time. And so you need a Russian presence and you're looking to find people who want an opportunity to succeed. Catherine turns to the old believers. And so that's how old believers get down into Ukraine. And they had already been there for some uh, part of it as well too. But there you actually see this new migration of communities uh, to the south, again, uh, the Cossack communities, which had been located in, again, I didn't have time to get into them because the Cossacks are a whole lecture in their own right. Um, the Cossacks are predominantly old believers as well, too. And they have lived in Ukraine and there are still Cossacks who live in Ukraine today as well, too. Uh, and so there are definitely old believers in Ukraine. That's how they get there. They're already there or they are sent there by Catherine. The old believer status outside of uh, Russia, again, there are old believers in most border states with Russia. Again, there are old believers still in Poland. There are old believers, again, there's a large old believer community in Riga uh, as well too. South America, again, there were a number in South America. There were some that go out to Shanghai in China as well too. Uh, there are even new communities that are in Indonesia. I've seen stories out of old right communities in Indonesia as well. But yes, as, as Michael points out, is that there are usual stories of old believer communities starting to move back to Russia because of the incentives that the Russian state had been giving to help move them out east into Siberia and things like that uh, to help their population. And then, of course, you have old believers uh, in Canada, United States, uh, and places like that. And they, they show up with your traditional you know, emigration movements in the New World and have been around for quite a while at this time. Well, thank you for that answer. And I will wrap up with one last question, which will be a synthesis of several questions from our attendees dealing with art and iconography. Victoria asks, in what way did old believers contribute to revival of religious icons in the early 20th century? And a similar question is, are there any significant differences between the old believer iconography and those of the Russian Orthodox Church? And uh, Nicholas asks, can you comment on the role of old believers in Russian art and participation in the pre-revolutionary avant-garde 
creation of major collections, participation in theater, etc. So okay. sort of an art question to, all to right. wrap yeah, up. No, that, that's good. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to answer the best I can uh, to get all three of them together. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually start with that last question about the art collections and um, theater and things like that. Is that they are big contributors, particularly by the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the Ryabuchinsky brothers uh, and the Morozovs are part of the reason the Tretyakov Gallery is put together. They're actually friends with the uh, with Tretyakov, uh, who and help him get his collection going. Uh, the Morozovs are big into the theater. In fact, uh, Sergei Morozov uh, gives regular large donations to the Bolshoi, as well as other theaters. They also sponsor a number of artists as well too. Uh, as regards to their influence on and differences between art is that the old believers staunchly maintain uh, the old, what they refer to as the old iconography styles, those that are, were popularized by like Andrei Rublov and, some, and, and so forth. Uh, in fact, a, a common critique of old believers all the way from Avakum all the way through the 19th century is that whenever an old believer is critiquing iconography, modern iconography, what starts to take on more and more Latin, Latin kind of styles, uh, they constantly refer to, well, Jesus and Jesus and all these people in these pictures look too fat. It's always one of their biggest complaints about art and iconography as it's changing is that people look too fat. Not that you need to necessarily make them look emaciated or things like that, but that it's, you know, it's that celebration of, you know, the human flesh. Well, no, 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 you're not supposed to be doing that. And so you need, and not only that, you're not supposed to truly look human. You're not revering a human figure. You're revering the representation. Uh, you're acting for inter you're asking for intercession and things like that. And so if you make things too beautiful, then that's a distraction from the meaning of the icon itself. And so that's one of these common critiques that old believers have is that, again, one, you're introducing Latin styles, so what the heck is wrong with you? Uh, and two, you're making them look too human. You're making them look too, uh, you know, again, high class art. You have high art. Old believers are certainly not against high art, but not meant for religious imagery. And so they are big on that. And so when people go into these collections, they, again, they open up schools in iconography uh, as well too, to relearn the old styles. They are open to teaching people new styles. Because again, an old believer, you know, many, most old right communities are not a, well, if you're not an old believer, we don't want to deal with you. They're happy to help. They want to reinvigorate that love for this ancient Russian uh, styles, ancient Russian culture and the like. And so I, I hope that answered all three questions <laughs> in, in one way or another. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll wrap up with this. And I really appreciate, again, this presentation. I think it's broken a lot of stereotypes, as you've mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, what we think of as the old believers. Thank you. Again, we learned so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone.